Uh, so welcome everybody. I uh, appreciate your participation in this second right away asset uh, mapping, mapping exchange. And what I'm gonna do today is talk a little bit about right away asset inventory and extraction using uh, 4D voxel technology, something that uh, many of you may not uh, have an understanding of. So what I'd like to do is to give you a brief overview of, uh, of voxel maps itself, talk a bit about this concept of uh, maps for machines, uh, then um, go a bit deeper into the technology understanding of how we, how we collect and manage content, and then uh, speak about 4D volumetric mapping, not just 3D, but 4D, and then uh, uh, address a number of right-of-way use cases, and then um, at the end, we'll open it up for questions. So history-wise, uh, we're a spin-out from a group called NAVME out of the UK. So it was an established navigation and, uh, and uh, high-definition mapping company with 16 years experience uh, in doing mapping, had mapped out, um, I think, 180 different countries in terms of the road network. So pretty significant uh, background in mapping. Uh, took some of the software capabilities and spun that out in 2017. And our two founders uh, actually were two of the founders of NAVME. Um, worldwide uh, headquarters are in San Francisco. Uh, we also, our European HQ is out of Nottingham, uh, England. We also have a European Development Center uh, out of St. Petersburg in Russia and opened up just recently a new office in uh, Porto, Portugal uh, for some of the project management stuff. And then um, we have a team in Mexico City that we just brought in as well to do some uh, additional development. So organizationally, We've got uh, 47 hours, probably in, ex in excess of 50 people full time. And then we hire a lot of employees on a part time basis uh, when we have field work. So like last summer, we had 365 part time people on, on projects uh, when we had a uh, project driving across North America. Um, and then a number of uh, intellectual property assets that we have as well in terms of uh, uh, filed U.S. patents on some of the technology and and, and pending uh, pending patents on the on that as well as the uh, the symbol mapping hardware that I'll be talking about a little bit later in our mapping platform called BAMS. So let's talk a little bit about this concept of maps for machines, and this is something that that we think is really important. So um, human maps are something that all of us here are really familiar. with. Right. So these are maps that are on our phone, um, they're in our cars, they're on our computers. Right. And generally speaking, they're there to help us solve a problem of navigation. Right. Um, it provides visualization of the, of the geodata. It tends to be two to two and a half D um, and allows us to navigate to an address. So it could be within a city or a street or even a particular building, you know, and then the data that we use for human maps tends to be a little bit lower in terms of re resolution of accuracy. So in the area of like th one to three meters, and it's usually 2D data, sometimes there are some aspects of 3D, but very little. When we go to the right-hand side here, and when we start to look at maps for machines, it's a very different environment. So we're talking about building models, which are true 3D models of everything we see, like a, a, a digital twin of the environment. And we're combining that with really high resolution accuracy of between one to 10 meter in terms of spatial accuracies. Uh, so just imagine trying to map the world, mapping cities down to one center resolution. And it's not about just the location of those objects, whether they be, uh, you know, signs or uh, utility asset poles, et cetera. Um, but it's about, it's all about those features and the measurements and the attribution of those objects as well, right? And by doing that, it creates a platform which really powers um, powers autonomy. So whether that's autonomous vehicles or delivery robots or things like automated miniature robots or AMRs or even UAVs and drones, right? Providing that level of accuracy. And in a voxel maps, we have a, a pretty unique way of doing that. So everyone online, I'm sure is really familiar with pixels, right? Um, we're used to using imagery and raster data. Uh, but a voxel, you know, is a 3D pixel. And just think of it that way. So we utilize a voxel model, which is kind of a cube. And we create a model of the entire planet. 
and then create a digital twin out of these really small voxels. Um, think of it as a, as a Minecraft version of the planet, you know? And so Minecraft uses voxels and many people are familiar with it because of that. However, it's heavily used in the medical community as well because you can uh, define uh, voxels down to minute uh, individual detail to actually map out brain matter as well in the, uh, in the medical field. So it's widely used across a number of industries. But what's unique about our approach to this whole maps for machines and the voxel structure is this, uh, our global approach to uh, the uh, global fixed uh, voxel occupancy grid. So it's a basically a mega voxel structure that we create and it's comprised of multi-resolution voxels uh, across the entire planet. So it's a Earth-centered, Earth-fixed model which is a, you know, a standard Cartesian sort of environment uh, with XYZ coordinates. But instead of uh, zero, zero being, you know, null island out west of Africa, uh, this is actually centered on the, the center mass of the, of, the, uh, of the Earth, okay? So what we do is we place this voxel model in place. Every voxel has a permanent position and a unique address, and then... Uh, we validate the occupancy status of the voxel. So in this model, um, basically the, the voxels, if it's through air, if, the, if, if there's nothing within that voxel, we create a nine meter voxel, okay? But when it gets down to having objects or feature class within that voxel, we get it down to between one to four uh, centimeters. So it creates this basically a, a global, both above ground and below ground, a global geodatabase for 3D and 4D data. And it's a real time persistent database, supports uh, petabytes at scale. Uh, we already have multiple petabytes in, uh, on, in storage currently, okay? So that kind of gives you an idea of the voxel structure. In terms of, in terms of our approach, in terms of uh, you know, how we manage it, so we have this, what well, we're, you know, our, our uh, goal and plan is to build this digital twin of the planet, okay? Uh, and it'll be a persistent live model, uh, very accurate and both indoor, so consuming both internal and external uh, data sets. So indoor and outdoor, uh, it's a 4D temporal spatial database. So uh, we can store data and manage it through time series as well. So we can go back and look at change detection and do automated feature extraction and automated feature change detection across a number of different use cases. Um, and we're also multi-market focused. So uh, we're working a lot with uh, state local governments in terms of smart cities, uh, with telecommunications, with GIS mapping, with utilities, robotics, uh, activity in the autonomous vehicles and you know, even some of the largest tech companies in the world are, are existing customers. On the collection side, we have the Symbo mobile mapping sensor, and I have a slide that goes into a little bit more detail on this. But basically, this is just a, a constant collection network of mapping sensors. So our strategy is to have a, a pretty substantial network of, of these Symbo devices out in the field collecting data and providing near real-time data collection. So collecting the data, sending that data in near real-time to, to a processing structure that then can uh, do the processing, the extraction, and deliver that information back out to the field in a, in a near real-time capacity. Um, and then the data is agnostic to us. So um, we use, you know, we do mobile data collection, but we have partners that do manned aerial as well as um, as well as UAVs as well. So it really, it really doesn't matter where the data comes from. It can be incorporated into the, uh, into the environment. In terms of the data insights, so this is the back end of our system, um, which we call VAMS, and it's a deep learning based AI recognition engine. And so it supports both 3D and 4D semantic segmentation. Um, basically training objects. So we've already done a lot of training to create, um, I call it feature class, but basically objects that can be automatically identified, uh, you know, so utility poles, uh, 
uh, lights, right? Or assets on the poles like conductors or closers, things such as that, okay? And then uh, we have this powerful AI search to retrieve the objects and then perform automatic measurements and then uh, vectorize that and provide that for consumption, whether it's in our product or in a wide variety of other products, you know, like a, uh, you know, like a ESRIs, ArcGIS, or Autodesk, or Bentley. So uh, really agnostic in that, in that approach to the terms of the next this, this is just a quick overview of the uh, of the Simbo. So this is our current version of Simbo. Uh, we have a new version that uh, we're taking delivery of in September. Um, I mentioned, you know, this constant collection network. So uh, the plan is to have uh, 70 of these, seven zero, uh, by the end of the year. And we'll be actively engaged in collecting uh, high definition maps over about the top 100 cities in the US, putting those into a spatial database providing access to that data as a service. So um, you'll be hearing more about that um, uh, in the coming months. So we have six cameras on this. Uh, we also have two uh, GP, excuse me, two LIDAR sensors. So we're getting up to about 2.4 2, 2 million points uh, per second. And, and uh, we can store up to 15 terabytes uh, on the device. Uh, one of the cool things that I like about this is that it's really lightweight, so it's less than nine kilograms, um, and it just fits on a Thule uh, bicycle rack. So it's really easy for the uh, individuals that work for us in the field to be able to put this on the on the uh, on the vehicle, and you know every morning put it on, take off, start doing data collection. End of the day pop it off, put it into its Pelican case, take it in the hotel room. Um, so it's a really quick and easy approach. Some of these, you know, some of the devices you'll see out there on the streets driving Google, et cetera. Well, it'll take two to three people, several hours to, to set it up. So then you have issues in the evening where you park the thing to make sure. So um, what's nice as well is that we do a lot of the initial processing on the device. So we have processing capabilities on the device and then in terms of managing that collection, it's just basically using an iPad. So it's not a, not a heavy footprint and not a heavy investment as well. Um, so we have these for ourselves, but we also sell the symbols uh, for other customers to, to do their own collection. So let's talk about this 4D volumetric digital tour that we're creating of the planet. So, you know, 3D maps, you know, our approximate visualizations of the cities and everybody's, everybody, you know, is uh, cognizant of this, has seen these data online, but they're really, they tend to be empty 3D meshes. So it's really, um, they virtualize the surface uh, or the matter and they're not a true digital model of the world. Uh, they tend to be low accuracy and they tend to generalize the structure. So when you zoom in and look at them, you know, a lot of it gets a little bit mushy, right? So um, it uh, it can be uh, a little bit deceiving in terms of the in terms of the structures themselves. Whereas with the 4D volumetric data, you know these are a complete data set of of a 3D model of all the matter, both surface as well as interior data. Uh, very high accuracy. So as I mentioned before, you know we're doing uh, collection at the one to four centimeter level, um, and then uh, each voxel has multiple time states. So you can uh, have this fourth dimension of time for automating the uh, change detection process. So we have this 3D volumetric measurement unit called the voxel. And then we provide surface data from the RGB values of the camera or hyperspectral or radar or you know whatever sensor you have, you can, uh, you can collect the data and uh, and 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 provide that as a surface uh, attribution for the particular voxel. Uh, we can then take that and do 3D semantic segmentation, deep learning using our AI tools, and extract from that. And then, as I mentioned, these multiple time states that one could then store the data for that particular voxel. Again, we're talking you know one to four centimeter voxel, so lots of change can take place. Um, you know, especially in an urban environment uh, across those uh, those voxels. 
And everything is a permanent address. So each voxel has its own permanent address within the spatial database. So it really supports uh, this intelligent search concept to be able to, uh, to search and perform uh, uh, change detection within those objects. So in terms of the digital twin, you know, that's really what our goal is to create this digital twin of the planet. So it's, you know, at the city, state, or country level, um, mapping everything that's visible to the sensor. So again, we're collecting both uh, LIDAR and imagery. So anything that's visible, we're trying to map out and extract as an individual feature. And then the digital twins allow us to access and extract, you know, many different acts, uh, features or assets uh, across various time segments. And then we can convert that into any format as well. So, um, you know, uh, our customers tend to use uh, geographic information systems. So we just put it in the format that's the easiest for them then to consume. So it may be just a shape file that we provide. Okay. So let me show you really quick what I mean by the digital twin. So this is the, uh, the initial voxels. We then colorize them. And then we do some initial of the AI segmentation, extract those features, um, vectorize them as objects. And then once I have that, then I can start, you know, taking the individual layers and manipulating the data. So get it off. I just want the roadways. That's all I'm interested in. Or, you know, roadways plus all the other assets, you know, including vegetation cover. Right? So it's a pretty not a simple process, it's a very involved process in terms of the processing, but a, uh, uh, you know, the technology that we have on the back end with the software allows this to happen in a, uh, in a semi-autonomous manner. And in the future, this whole multi-resolution model as well. So as, you know, I mentioned the multi-resolution voxel occupancy grid, again, the MR VOG, it's multi-resolution, right? So, different types of data can be merged together. And so we, you know, we're merging mobile or mobile uh, using aerial LIDAR uh, access via manned aerial as well as UAS uh, assets, uh, various, you know, EO satellites, uh, electro optical satellite, visual, or multi or hyperspectral radar. So a lot of different uh, sensor types that can be consumed in the system and then displayed. Um, and so, some of these images here, that I'm showing is actually from some activity we're doing with a, uh, a, uh, a group called the Earth Archive Congress that is creating a digital twin of the planet. And uh, we're one of the uh, founding members and supporters of it as well. Um, and then, you know, one of the areas that we're really spending a lot of time in terms of research is just the whole real-time model. So via API access, uh, you know, being able to incorporate real-time data feeds as overlays into uh, the voxel clouds, you know, uh, within the model, and then perform real-time calculations. The software uh, I mentioned before is called VAMS, our, our back-end software, and it's a voxel address and, and mapping system. And it basically it allows uh, the automatic recognition, measurement, and extraction of assets into you know any required mapping format. So, as I mentioned, um, you know we have a number of of, uh, of features that have been uh, class basically classified you know as objects in our library, and then the system uses that library to go and automatically classify features. So it could be that you you know if you have some unique features that you need to pull out. Um, we can work with you to do that. We, we have a customer that we're training next week that is looking at uh, certain types of windows across the city. And so we're training, we're working with them and they'll be training the algorithms to uh, extract uh, windows and be able to identify them as specific types of windows. So, so lots of capability within that software. And one of the things that it can do is, you know, it can do automatic extraction, but it also allows interactive. So you can actually uh, interactively train the algorithms to uh, to extract. Let me just show this real quick. This is a short one. So it's automatically identifying tree as vegetation, right? Um, and then we can go in and identify other features like trunks, 
right? And so identify that, identify other vegetation that, did, that wasn't classified, it'll automatically go through and, uh, and do the classification. So uh, a, uh, it's both automated and interactive process, right? And it's all in online web interface tools. And again, this is, these are tools that we use internally, they're developed for our internal processes, but this software is also available to our customers. So whether the customer, uh, you know, acquires one of the Symbo systems or whether they use their own UAS LiDAR, they can still use our system and the whole virtual reality viewer um, on the back end to uh, manipulate, uh, consume and manipulate and deliver that content to their customer. So this is gonna show you, uh, this is the Embocadero uh, in San Francisco. And this is just a, a video showing quickly how um, this, we uh, were, hang on a second here, stop it for a second. So basically we've taken and we've taken the voxels and colorized it using the uh, RGB values from the camera. And then from that, we can then do the auto extraction Oops, popped it back to the beginning again. Um, we'll do the auto extraction of the individual features that have been defined in the system, all right? And then you can see here different colors, meaning different sorts of features, you know, driving through the, the vegetation there. And then what, it, what we can do then is, is do measurements on those features. You can see measurements popping up here in terms of the height of the poles, right? And then, we can take that data and auto vectorize it and export it. And the same thing on the roadways, like on the right over here on, uh, on the road leading to Sausalito. So, you know, capturing uh, all the striping, capturing edge of pavement, capturing, uh, you know, light poles, capturing any sort of, uh, of signage for a signage inventory. So lots of different capabilities um, to do that in both a uh, automated or semi-automated manner. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, right-of-way asset mapping use cases. So in thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, you know, when, some, when somebody talks about right-of-way, right, what does that mean? What, you know, initially when people, when I think originally right-of-way, I'm thinking transportation, but there's a lot of assets that sit within a right-of-way. So it's not just, you know, transportation, it's utilities, it's public works or water and sewerage. So the, and, and, and what do I want to do with it? You know, I want to do a bridge assessment. I want to identify all my drainage features, identify all my culverts, right? Or uh, I want to do a signage inventory or a uh, curb and gutter. And within the curbs, you know, uh, I need to find places that need to have uh, ADA compliance. So as, a, um, as an ecosystem, I look at the right of way basically as an ecosystem with potential uh, use cases across a wide variety of, uh, of different markets. So I'll share with you uh, some of the use cases that we've been involved in um, at, at, uh, at Voxel Maps. So installation compliance. So this was a uh, equipment installation compliance for local government. And so uh, again, you're thinking what I was talking about before on the 4D uh, biometric mapping, you know, this was critical to them. So they had an existing inventory and then we went and drove uh, the city's network of roads, did the automatic feature recognition measurements, and then we're able to map uh, new features, uh, new objects uh, back to uh, what had been contracted to be done or what had been licensed to be added and uh, identifying any areas of non-compliance and uh, provided that to the end customer. Okay. And, and so one thing I will bring up here is that, is that, the delivery uh, and what we provide in customers is it, it, it goes along a pretty broad spectrum. So, and sometimes we're collecting and delivering raw data. That's it. We're just doing the collection and providing raw data. Other times we do the processing, say, um, an extraction and classification of LIDAR point cloud, right? Other times it's classification of that point cloud and the extraction of the objects. In other cases, it's the all the way to the extraction of the objects and then doing some sort of report or insight generation, right? Um, and that's what is provided to the end customer. So a pretty broad 
as I mentioned, a pretty broad spectrum of what we deliver. Um, here's another one of, uh, of a signage inventory. So we, we drove uh, a number of roads, many, many miles of roads, and did a traffic sign data collection and mapping for a major navigation company. So in this case, they were interested in not only extracting the signage, but also doing OCR to identify what's, what is on the sign, right? Um, Seven million signs were mapped and we did the automated sign recognition. And then for them, we just converted all that data to XML and delivered that. Now, 7 million signs sounds like a lot. So I was thinking last night and I said, okay, how many, you know, how many miles is 7 million, 7 million signs? Well, if you had a sign every 15 feet along a roadway, that's 20,000 miles a road, just to give you an idea about the size of this project, okay? Pretty significant. So we have a lot of experience doing uh, very large data collection uh, uh, requirements. So this one, a road network mapping for a major automotive company, you know, we created uh, HD maps for autonomous vehicles. So you're collecting, uh, you know, uh, the road lane model. So you're sometimes driving driving the roadway several times, traffic signs, striping, all the localization objects to help the vehicle know where it's at, okay? Now, last, I, I mentioned, you know, the number of part-time employees we had last summer. You know, we did a project last summer in North America, where we drove over 650,000 miles of roadway across uh, Canada and the US. 650,000 miles. Um, that's a lot of data. That's a lot of data and a lot of, uh, a lot of experience, I would say, you know, in terms of uh, data collection. So not, I would say not many organizations have the experience level of collecting the amount of data that we have uh, from a mobile, uh, mobile asset. Asset inventory. So here's another one. This is more in the electrical transmission and electrical distribution. So in this case, utility infrastructure was captured using aerial LIDAR. Okay. And uh, we did uh, all the data processing of the customer capture content. And then this AI uh, machine learning automated feature extraction and then validated the assets and created a database of those assets for uh this particular uh, end user or customer. Uh, vegetation uh, management and encroachment. So in this case, you know, asset capture using both mobile and aerial LIDAR. So you can use both and, and merge the two together. And we did the data processing of the content and then the automated feature extraction of, you know, the, uh, the poles, the conductor wires, vegetation, et cetera. And then from that, do a buffer and overlay, you know, a buffer around each uh, each conductor line at various distances, seeing where we had uh, encroachment issues on those conductors, and then identify the uh, uh, the vegetation, the location, and the amount of vegetation for uh, work order uh, submittal. Uh, this was a project we did for a telecommunications company. So this was an interesting one because of the delivery, right? So um, we had driven a city before. So we had the data in, uh, in archive. And then we, uh, this particular telecommunications company, had contracted to have a number of new 5G towers uh, placed on, uh, on pole assets across, across their service area. So we did this multi-time frame data collection did the processing, uh, did the uh, AI ML based automated feature extraction. So it automatically identified the location of new 5G uh, antennas. And then we use that to validate uh, the con contractor work orders and made sure that they were placed, they were placed and they were placed on the right assets as well. So in this case, the customer wasn't worried about, you know, if you look at this image, it wasn't worried about that second poll, right? All they wanted to know was, Show me where I have at new assets located on what pole. That was it. So an interesting delivery at that point. Um, we've also done some uh, work with another telco on uh, uh, delivery of, of or creating a model. In this case, we built a digital twin of an area. So we not only did the driving, 
but then we used uh, robots and backpack model to collect the inside of it. So we created a, a digital twin of this area. And then we ran from their 5G towers, we ran the signal attenuation models within the voxel uh, spatial database uh, to determine coverage gaps, both external and internal to the, cu to the customer's facility. So they were looking at not only when people are on the street, but you know, employees in the building, you know, in Office 5G, do they have uh, you know, solid coverage of that, uh, of that? And so this just gives you an idea that we just created you know, each one of these voxels in that space, that airspace is the uh, signal model, okay? Let me just show you real quick here. So this just shows a 3D, basically a fly through, through the model. So you can see the various colors and the colors are the signal strength of the, uh, the 5G signal in that particular environment, okay? And with some, you know, with some of the new uh, 5G signals coming out that can actually penetrate buildings better, you know, having these these true uh, models, digital twins, where one can provide uh, the values of the structure type will be really valuable in terms of uh, doing this in the future. Um, Autonomous vehicles is another area where we're all seeing uh, pretty substantial growth in terms of uh, data collection and capture, especially on roadways and rights of way, knowing where signs are, are they too close to the road, you know, make sure people understand and then provide that, you know, the, the sign information to people as part of their, their navigation experience as well. So we recently did a, a uh, an innovative project um, with a, uh, a couple of organizations. So you know, in the, in the existing world of HD map creation, we go out and we do data collection harvesting via an HD mobile mapping system, right? And then usually what happens is there's, there's so much data here that that data gets delivered to a data center. The hard drives are actually delivered to a data center. They then do the processing and then they can do, you know, this voxel-based AI feature extraction and the vectorization and then creating that final um, HD model, okay? Um, and then at some point in about a month period of time, at a, an additional month period of time, those updated maps are then loaded up to the vehicle, uh, vehicles, down, well, a database, and then downloaded to the vehicles, excuse me. So you're talking, you know, between one month and six weeks process in terms of from the time of data collection to the time of update in the vehicle. So we did a, a process of a, uh, a project with a couple different companies. One, it was with Verizon and uh, Amazon Web Services. And so um, Amazon uh, has uh, this Amazon Wavelength is basically an, an Amazon instance, processing instance at the telecommunications facility. So it doesn't go 5G to the telco across the internet to wave to uh, an Amazon service. It goes 5G to the Amazon wavelength service. So it cuts down very low latency. The 5G edge from Verizon is a, um, a, a new very low latency uh, mobile edge, sort of a 5G bandwidth um, a capability from Verizon. So we had uh, a Wi-Fi uh, antenna on the collection device we're able to collect the data and do some initial processing on the sensor, 5G the data across the Verizon network to the AWS Wavelength instance, process that data. And, and again, this particular data, we were only processing the LiDAR data because of the real heavy footprint of the image data. So we processed that and then delivered that back to the vehicle. Average was 15 second turnaround. So we went from a six weeks period of time in terms of updating to a near 15 second. Now, mind you, this requires 5G services, you know, across an entire network, not just small areas. Um, but, you know, uh, the future of safer uh, autonomous vehicles and this vehicle to everything community is pretty significant. If you think about it, um, I read an article last week and it said that um, each autonomous vehicle will generate 
uh, uh, three, uh, three terabytes of data per day, 30 terabytes, excuse me, 30 terabytes of data per day per autonomous vehicle, right? That's 3,000 times the data generated by Twitter each day, right? 3,000 times Twitter each day, one vehicle. So you can imagine the networks that we're going to have to require from the telco side to be able to support that as we move into the future. And I'll just show this real quick. I won't show the whole thing, but this just shows you how much data was being captured. And again, basically each one of these blocks is 200 meters of data. And again, it was updated. Each one of those blocks was updated about every 15 seconds on average. So quite a significant amount of data that we were collecting. So in review, uh, I gave you a quick overview of Voxel Maps, who we are, where we came from. Uh, we talked about this whole maps for machine concept and how it's different. It's a different way of thinking in terms of geospatial content. Um, talked a bit about Voxel Maps technology and, uh, and how we approach uh, this whole 4D volumetric mapping capability. And then uh, I went over some right away use cases and potential uses of the, of the technology. So with that, I'd like to just open it up for questions. So, well, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, we have seven minutes and seven questions in queue. <laughs> so um, let me start right with the first one. Um, our service area is quite large. What is the largest area you have been contracted to collect? Um, so as I mentioned last year, Voxel Maps collected over a million kilometers, almost 650,000 miles on one project um, across Canada and the continental US. So that's about, you know, 50 towns around the earth at the equator, uh, pretty significant amount of driving. So we can handle pretty large uh, data collection projects and have have experience with, with uh, you know, doing the project management operations. And I think that's one of the key things. We've got some really stellar employees on the project management and operations side of our organization. Uh, great. Um, we have invested heavily in LIDAR processing. If we have you collect the data, are we required to use you for the processing? No, nope. <clears throat> no, that, that's really up to the customer, you know, uh, in terms of the level of processing they require from us. And, you know, we perform data collection only projects all the way through just providing the extracted content, kind of what I was talking about on that telco one with the uh, the 5G antenna. So um, it really depends on what you want uh, as a deliverable. So we're pretty open as to uh, really how we can support the various projects that you have. Great. Um, how many miles a day can you collect capturing both LIDAR and imagery? So, you know, with the Symbo device, uh, we can collect about 60 linear effective miles per day. So each vehicle will actually collect about 150 overdrive miles. Um, no, hang on a second. This just shows you. So this is drive. This is one of our drivers. All right. And you can see that and forth. And so there you have overdrive there, overdrive on the exit ramp, overdrive again. So, you know, we're collecting a lot of area, but there's a lot of over, a lot of what we call overdrive. All right. But again, you know, our plan uh, is to have 70 of these sensors in action. So when we're not doing uh, paid for mapping projects, they'll be on the street doing data collection on spec. So again, we're building this archive of data over the top, you know, initially the top 100 cities in the U.S., and then that data will be available via a data as a service model online. Uh, great. Um, we perform imagery and LIDAR data collection with various platforms, including mobile, manned, uh, manned aerial, and UAVs. Can you provide the processing and automated extraction of data that we collect? Yeah, you can. We can. So, you know, the voxelization of the content and the processing, classification and extraction can all be performed on virtually any data set. So it really doesn't matter. And so, you know, I would just suggest, you know, you can reach out to me after the event. You can stop in the networking lounge. I'll be there for most of the day. And uh, we can talk about doing a test or a proof of concept for you. Great. Um, 
I like the high definition maps you can create with your Simbo system. However, I also need to collect top down views of some of my assets. How, how can you collect both? Uh, good question. Good question. So, you know, when you think about you think about the utility distribution network, you know, and looking at damage to say cross arms, right? Can't necessarily see that damage on top of a pull from rot, right? From top of the cross arm. So, um, we have strategic relationships with both uh, manned aerial and UAS based data collection organizations, uh, strategic partners. So, we can consume a wide variety of the, the that rich sensor content that they that they create from various platforms, and then we utilize our BAM software to process and manipulate it. So really, again, it doesn't matter where the data comes from, we can still consume that. And again, we have partners that uh, support us in some of our project activities. Thanks. Um, how does Voxel Maps address the challenges with data delivery in terms of file sizes or formats? So, you know, the, uh, one of the challenges of this high resolution remote sensing data is file size and be able to use, you actually use the data instead of just having a pretty picture. So we have a variety of software to ensure that uh, we can deliver in the correct formats. So, you know, like I said, Autodesk and um, Esri or MicroStation, whatever, whatever you're using. And then we can customize the, the size of the files that we deliver to make sure that um, uh, we give you the file sizes that you know map into the software you're using as well as your, your project size. And as I mentioned before, so we're you know we're doing this this uh, digital twin of the planet, right? And so that data that we're collecting as part of this ongoing process will actually be available online via data as a service. So you'll be able to use you know OGC compliant calls to be able to call and access you know feature services to to deliver that content directly into your applications. And finally, um, with automated sign inventory, what is your margin of error for identification and rate of collection? And, and what is your rate of collection? Yeah, so um, with, uh, with you know, solid training of the algorithms on, on those particular signage, um, that, that one in particular was at the 98 percentile um, is what I was told. So um, that was a project done before I before I arrived 90 days ago. But um, the the average or the accuracy was in the 98th percentile. So again, it it really depends on the um, the training of the algorithms to know what feature it's looking for, right? And that's the whole that's the holy grail of every AI ML tool out there. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, looking forward to having you uh, later in the in the panel. Um, and uh, now it's time for our next presentation.